Lord Forsyth, thanks a lot for joining us at GB News. Your committee, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Select Committee, has just published possibly one of the most strongly worded reports I've ever read in several decades of following British politics. Why is the language in this report so strong? Well, I don't know if the language is, is particularly strong. I mean, it's a big issue. Um, we are creating money with a, a lot of risks, uh, risks for inflation, uh, and we've seen the uh, quantitative easing grow and grow in scale, and we've just, we've just uh, increased, doubled it um, in the last 12 months. And it isn't exactly clear what the consequences of that will be or why the uh, Bank of England chose to create 450 billion pounds of, of, of QE. And um, what the report does is point to some of the risks and ask a number of questions of the bank to try and explain how they are coping with those risks. As you say, we've gone from around £425 billion of quantitative easing, money creation, during the decades since the 2008 financial crisis until the beginning of the pandemic, if you like. But since the pandemic, we've done even more quantitative easing uh, in just a year, a year and a half, more than we'd done in the previous decade. What's your main fear about that quantitative easing, you and the committee? Well, I think it was summed up uh, by me by the the, the departing chief economist um, Andy Haldane of the Bank of England, of the yeah. Bank of England, yeah, who said that they were in uncharted territory, and they are in uncharted territory. If you ask the bank, how did you come to this four hundred and fifty billion figure, they will say, well, it was based on our uh, obligation to keep inflation at two percent. Um, but if you take the top people who hold government bonds, they think that the reason that they did 450 billion was in order to help the government to fund their uh, commitments arising from, from COVID and that we're engaged in monetary financing. And if people believe that the bank is engaged in monetary financing, then the bank will lose credibility and we will be heading for very high levels of inflation and they will find it very difficult to control uh, the levels of inflation, which of course will be disastrous for anyone with a mortgage or anyone with savings or or indeed many people in jobs because inflation is the father and mother of unemployment, as Jim Callaghan said many years ago. That Labour Prime Minister of the 70s, when inflation in the UK did reach 20-25%. There's an awful lot to unpack in what you just said, so let's have a go. So up until now, the Bank of England has been doing quantitative easing and it says it's doing that in order to keep the economy going and try and get the price level high enough so we don't suffer from something called deflation. But the danger is now that the Bank of England is simply using the money it's creating to buy treasury bills off the treasury, government debt, if you like, helping the government to finance its spending rather than the government finances its spending from the normal way through taxation. And so the danger is that there's so much money sloshing around in the economy that in the end, that will lead to much higher prices as it did back in the 70s. And aren't we seeing signs of that now? We've got inflation in the UK. It's gone up from just 0.5% a few months ago. And now it's through 2.1% to 2.5% in June on the figures that came out just a couple of days ago. I mean, aren't you being proved right already on the very day your report's well, being published? Well, we're, we're, we're not actually making any predictions about what the future level of inflation will be, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the bank, um, the last three months, the inflation rate has been higher than they, they, they expected. The bank are saying, in common with central bankers around the world, all of whom have been doing this, and we spoke to people from um, many different countries, different former central bankers and economists. So this is not just a, a British... Um, phenomenon, the bank needs to explain why they think that this inflation is just going to be a temporary thing, um, why it, you know, will, it will go up and it will go the down. transitory is the word that we're being instructed to use. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I can remember what it was like, as you say, in the 70s and 80s. And if you talk to any builder uh, today uh, about what's happened to wood prices or cement prices, if you can get the cement or uh, or if you talk to employers, the pressure that are on wages, or you talk to anyone who wants to employ a lorry driver. Now, the bank will say, oh, well, this is just temporary because it's a reaction to the fact that we've had 
But um, it does seem a bit strange when you've got this uh, huge uh, level of savings, which people will spend, and a huge demand in the economy. Why is the bank wanting to do the extra 50 billion of QE that they haven't done now? You would expect them to hold back. Um, and uh, our report simply asks the bank to explain, show their workings, as used to say uh, in my maths exams at school, show their workings. How did they come up with this 450 billion figure? And is it just a coincidence it just happened to be what the government needed to spend? And the only really senior person at the Bank of England on the Monetary Policy Committee who was arguing along these lines, saying that maybe we should rein in the QE, rein in the money creation, was the chief economist, Andy Haldane, who you mentioned, who has just left, some say, because he's very, very frustrated that he's not being listened to. So I asked, actually, I asked the, uh, when the governor and the deputy governors before the committee, I asked them about Andy Haldane and... Um, uh, they said, "Oh well, he was he was something. He was a bit he was a bit of an optimist, but actually, um, his he's been proved right on his view of V-shaped recovery, and um, I just I just think you know he may be wrong, but the bank ought to have a clear plan of what they're going to do if their views about transitory inflation turn out to be wrong, and it's very worrying. I mean the." Uh, we're seeing the same thing uh, from from the Fed, where they're saying the Federal oh, Reserve, the US yeah, Central Bank. Yeah, if they if they um, if inflation gets out of control, they'll act. Well, if it's got out of control, it's too late. That's right. You need to you need to be ahead of the curve here. Otherwise, you end up people start anticipating the rate of inflation. They start putting up their prices. They start making demands on wages, and of course, the only tool that the bank would have would be to put up interest rates. And that, because of the huge level of quantitative easing, uh, results in a very large bill for the Treasury and more headache for the Chancellor, who's already struggling to, to make ends meet. That really is a point at the heart of your committee's report, isn't it? And a point that Andy Haldane has been making. Unless you get ahead of the curve on inflation, unless you start raising interest rates before the inflation horse has bolted, if you like, then you end up having to raise interest rates much, much more than you otherwise would do, mm. imposing more pain on ordinary mortgage holders, ordinary businesses, ordinary people that need to borrow money for various reasons to control inflation again, because that inflation gets into the supply chain, into expectations, exactly. into wage negotiations, into the supply of inputs that go into the goods yeah, I mean, imagine and services if you, that we buy in the shops. Imagine if you were a builder or a joiner who had given a quote on a job and you were working it on now and you suddenly discover that your wood is now twice as expensive. Um, you are not going to be listening to the governor of the Bank of England saying, no. don't worry, it's temporary. You're not going to get caught again. So you put up your prices That's by right. more. And that is how it works. And it then takes off and you have more inflation. Well, uh, I'm not saying that the bank are wrong, but I'm saying they should absolutely spell out why they think it's transitory and what they would do if it, if it wasn't. Because just be clear about this. I mean, I'm a politician, so I know how politicians operate. And can you imagine how the Chancellor will react to the idea of interest rates going up, given that it's going to add hugely to its problems um, it will put with public expenditure and financing it? Um, they wouldn't be human if there wasn't an attempt to put a bit of pressure on the bank. And the bank has to be seen to be completely independent or it will lose or credibility. And they also have to wake up to the fact that now that they are involved in such a huge program, which has a huge impact in the economy, we no longer can have the, the man in Threadneedle Street knows best. Um, we no longer can just trust them. They need to actually explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. And instead of having this group think and, and not actually engaging, they need to be accountable because it has a huge impact on public services, on people's mortgages, uh, on their jobs, and a whole and our, and, and our ability as a country to compete. So you're saying the Bank of England is too remote from the economy, too much of an ivory tower? I'm saying that um, they need to show their working. They need to explain what they're doing and why, and they need to engage. And we can't just, you know, um, have, uh, well, the, the governor of the bank thinks this. I'm not saying that we should challenge his independence, but he should be able to explain why? I mean, for example, he told our committee uh, there is this huge quantitative easing which will need to be unwound at some stage. 
And he told our committee that the previous policy, which was to put up interest rates first and then unwind, that they were thinking of reversing that. Well, why? What prompted that? And what is the, what's the thinking behind that? Now, um, I, you're obviously much more in touch than, than I am with what is going on um, uh, day to day, but I, I don't think that's been properly explained. I don't think um, they've even explained how they would, would unwind QE, because if you look at the United... Withdrawing some of that massive amount of money that's just uh, yeah, plonked into the economy willy-nilly. Ex exactly, and um, you've seen, I mean, the Americans tried it, and there was a thing called a taper tantrum, which when is... the markets went nuts, right? Yeah, exactly, because they've become addicted to it. That's the really eye-catching thing about your report. You obviously uh, had some good headline writers, with all respect to your committee, quantitative easing, a dangerous addiction, question mark. That's why I talked about strong language, because that is quite a punchy title for a parliamentary report. And it strikes me that you're correct. There is an addiction here because what happens if the Bank of England suggests it may start to basically print less money or produce less money is financial markets who have been weaned on this excess money, they start to go down. It seems to me that we can't be held hostage by financial markets. They're massively overvalued. The stock market's a bubble. The bond market's a bubble. And it's I, I, my view personally, you may disagree, Lord Forsyth, is that the Bank of England is extremely frightened about the stock market rebelling if it decides for solid macroeconomic reasons, it wants to do a bit less QE, or yeah, even but, reverse QE. Yeah, They're but, held hostage. Uh, well, uh, uh, they may be held hostage, but the problem is, actually the evidence we got is that QE doesn't actually have much of an impact in terms of increasing growth or uh, dealing with uh, employment. Um, no, no, uh, it doesn't increase growth or, or the economy, all it does but it make, does pump up financial markets yeah, and, and stock and say, bond prices. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say is what it does is make a lot of very rich people richer yeah. and it increases um, inequality on a big scale. I mean, it, uh, it it gives those people who've got wealth even more wealth. Houses, stocks, yeah. bonds. Exactly. Yeah. So ask any youngster trying to buy a flat. Yeah. Um, and, and they're very much aware of the effects of quantitative easing. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, and so it's a even if they can't say it. Yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, if they read our report, it might might give them an indication of of of, of what it what it what is going on here. So it's 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 a difficult it's a difficult problem. Um, but it, but the more that you add to quantitative easing, the more you build it up, the harder it is to unwind. And so the title of the report, um, a dangerous addiction. It's dangerous because it can have inflationary effects. It's dangerous because it's extremely difficult to reverse. And it's dangerous because it creates great social inequality. And that is always dangerous in any society. And attempting to reverse QE could, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, am I? It could lead to a financial crisis, a rerun of 2008 in simple terms. Well, um, uh, our report is looking to the governor and the bank to explain how they're going to avoid that and how they're going to unwind it. But it's if a you danger, look, though. It yeah, it, danger. it is a danger. And if you look around the world, uh, no one uh, has succeeded in unwinding QE. Um, as I said, the Americans tried it and they pulled back because they were because of the so-called taper tantrum. Now we've got a situation where you've produced this report. Um, you're an eminent former cabinet minister. You have on your committee some very heavyweight figures, not least Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England. You've got John Monks, who used to run the TUC. You've got Lord Skidelsky, another eminent economist and historian. It's pretty much an across-the-board thing. People of no parties and of all parties. Um, and yet this is, isn't it, the first proper major independent investigation of quantitative easing in this country not just in this country. A policy which is arguably the most important and the most controversial economic policy of the last 10 years. Why is yours the first ever report? Well, um, interesting enough, when, when I suggested we might do that, a lot of people said, oh, well, it's very complicated and it's very technical and you'll get into an argument between new monetarists and Keynesians and, and all of that. Actually, it's not very complicated no. at all. 
Um, it's common sense, to it's, uh, indeed. If you create loads more money, there's going to be lots of inflation. Yeah, and history tells us that lots of people have tried it, and it always ends the same way. And um, uh, they always persuade themselves that this time it's different. Um, so there are huge there are huge dangers here. Um, that is not to say that quantitative easing after the financial crisis in two thousand and eight uh, was not a sensible uh, policy to introduce liquidity. But we but the reasons for quantitative easing and the scale of quantitative easing have changed as we go along the the, the, the road, and that that that's what's concerning. And one has the impression that for the Bank of England now. Um, it's like watching somebody trying to play golf with only one club. I mean, every problem, every economic problem, the answer is QE. And Which is a very extreme emergency measure, right? Correct, yeah. But the emergency measures become a lifestyle choice. Yeah. I mean, that is the essence of an addiction. Mm. And so um, we tried to produce a report. And as you say, I've got some real big brains on the committee. Uh, it's a unanimous report. There's no disagreement about it. Um, uh, we tried to produce a report which would explain to people who weren't, you know, brilliant um, economic journalists like you or economists or, or people, just ordinary, right ordinary folk, that it would be accessible to them. Or what are the issues here? What exactly is QE? Why are we doing it? What are the issues? What are the possible risks? And, and we press the Bank of England to start answering the questions about why they did things and what the risks were. And, and they will have to respond to our report, the bank will have to respond, and the Treasury will have to respond to those parts which concern the Treasury. And then there will have to be a debate in, 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 in the House of Lords on the report and on their responses, which will probably be in the autumn, and I'm looking forward to that. Just going back to 2009, when we first yeah. did quantitative easing after the global financial crisis, I'm with you. Law Forsyth, I did agree with quantitative easing mm. then, but when quantitative easing was first announced, it was a £50 billion pound temporary measure to ensure there's enough liquidity in our banking system that the banking system didn't collapse, which would have caused, caused carnage because the cash machines stopped working and yeah. you'd get queues around the block and civil disorder. That's what happens during runs on banks. So I totally agree with that. But we went from £50 billion to 425 billion <laughs> seven or eight years later. So QE was eight or nine times bigger than first advertised. And then we've more than doubled it again mm. since. And I think the reason that's happened is because QE has friends in very high places. It has friends in financial markets because this stuff makes the stocks and bonds and property portfolios that you hold go up in value. And QE also has friends within government. Because if you do QE, it means you can carry on borrowing cheaply as a government without having to raise taxes. So you have a soft budget constraint. You can spend pretty much what you want. For a while. For a while. And then it comes back to bite you. There you go. But we're in the for a while phase still, aren't we? And for my money, that is why we haven't been discussing this. Because it's just been filed in the too difficult box. Mm. Because so many... Powerful people want this to carry on, be they in the city of London, be they in Westminster and Whitehall. So, you know, journalists like me who have railed against this and tried to point out some common sense and history, until your report, frankly, Lord Forsyth, have been dismissed as mad. Yeah. And your report legitimises this critique of QE, which many, many people in the silent majority out there share and that's why i think it's an important report well it will force it will force people to explain why that why they're doing it i mean i think whether there's some great conspiracy or, or or not um i mean you must make your own mind up about that i mean we've 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 basically just set out the facts as we see them we got evidence from lots of distinguished people every part of our report every conclusion we've come to is based on the evidence we've received there's no kind of we're not making it up ourselves, sure. uh, and I think the uh, it's hard to escape the the conclusion that uh, this. I mean, I think it's the biggest economic question facing our country and indeed the world at the moment is this use of quantitative easing and how how we're going to unwind from it and how we avoid um, disaster. I wouldn't use the word conspiracy. I'd just use basic political analysis with all respect, Lord Forsyth. If you've got lots of politicians 
who see there's a policy that allows them to spend without having to raise taxes, they're going to go for it. It, well, used, to well, called, it used to be called the Private Finance Initiative. Now it's quantitative easing. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I accept that. And one of the things that really worries me, no names, but I, I encounter colleagues who are in high office who think that they can continue spending because money is so cheap. That's right. And so what the report tells them is you can't. Because the bond market's basically rigged, right? Because the, the Bank of England is now such an important player in the market for government bonds that they dominate the price of bonds. They dominate the price at which government can borrow money. But that can't go on mm. forever. It's unsustainable. So yeah, the Bank on. of England, um, in buying uh, bonds um, on which um, there is a coupon, because the bank rate is below the coupon rate, um, uh, the asset purchase um, organization within the bank at the moment is making a profit That's and, right. and so they have transferred to the treasury over the last 10 years well over 100 billion pounds but when interest rates go up that gets reversed that's right um and and so uh, we had people suggesting actually the way to get around that problem which is a big bill for the treasury is that you simply stop paying money uh, paying interest on uh, deposits which the commercial banks have got with the bank of england well, that's, that's a tax on the banks, right? Ex, ex, and that could seriously destabilise ex, the banking system. Exactly. And the, yeah. and the governor, the governor actually, when he gave evidence to it, said exactly that. He said, it's our transmission me mechanism, yeah. it's a tax on the bank. But the fact that people are even thinking about yeah. that shows, you know, some of the risks that are involved in, in this QE. Um, and a lot of people, colleagues in politics and so on, their eyes just glaze over when you say QE because they think it's a, a, a technical thing, whereas, as you well know, it's it's not actually that complicated. Now, when I gave evidence to your committee, because yeah. I... Well, I mentioned extinguished people had given us evidence. Because I did. I made the point that pre-COVID QE is very different, different from post-COVID QE, Correct. and I wondered what your committee made of that. The reason I made that argument is because pre-COVID QE basically stayed with inside the financial system. It stayed within the banking system. It was often redeposited at the central bank, the Bank of England, uh, as reserves, so banks could bolster their balance sheets. It sounds very complicated, but it isn't. It basically went into financial markets. Post-COVID QE is being used pretty much directly to fund government spending on furlough schemes, on business support loans for firms that are struggling with our shuttered economy. So it's there ready to spend when lockdown lifts. So therefore it's much, much more inflationary than pre-COVID QE. Did your committee basically agree with that conclusion? They, um, they, they, they believe that there's a risk uh, that it will prove to be inflationary. Um, uh, you're, you're absolutely right about um, both the scale and the nature of it. And I have to say, if I were the governor of the Bank of England, I'm not sure I'd be doing that extra 50 billion of QE, which they, they still have in their, in their locker as part of that 450, looking at where prices were going, looking at um, what is happening in the economy at the moment. There's huge demand in the economy at the moment. Why would you, why would you want to increase that demand if, if, if you can see inflation coming down the track? Because we said, the fundamentally important thing is to maintain the reputation, which is strong with the Bank of England, absolutely, and its and its ability and, and its ability to be independent. We didn't really feel able to uh, criticise the bank for their judgments, but we do feel able to make the bank explain why they have reached these conclusions. That was where we we rested. But you're you're much more um, you're you're more of a commentator. You're more of a uh, an analyst, and, and we thought it was our job to try and get the bank to be held to account for what it's doing, as opposed to expressing a view one way or the other. And I think that's entirely reasonable, and I do think this is genuinely a path-breaking report, and I think your committee is to be congratulated for, if you like, going there, for talking about this policy that's so important, yet no one wants to talk uh, about uh, it. We have a, a fantastic... Um, uh, a special advisor who's very experienced um, in, in these matters uh, internationally. And she rather surprised the committee by saying, you do re realise this is the first parliamentary report anywhere mm. on QE. Mm. Um, it's certainly obviously the first. And, and the great thing about the House of Lords, if I can just do a brief commercial for the House of Lords, 
is every single person on that committee, they're not, they're not wanting to, they're not looking over their shoulder for promotion. They're not want, we're not elected and, and therefore we can say what we think. And all of them have got uh, you know, experience in their various Proper fields. Yeah. Yeah. And our committees always operate on the basis of the evidence that we've received. And the evidence was overwhelming. And uh, it was quite, quite noti noticeable how there's a certain amount of groupthink in this area. So you get a string of people who would you know, put the same point of view. Um, and then you'd have other people like you who would challenge uh, that point of view. Um, but you have to be, as, as we saw in the run-up to the financial crisis, you have to be quite brave, really, to take on the on the consensus, as Andy Haldane has discovered. Final question, Law Forsyth. Um, it strikes me that we are at a turning point in economic policy making as we look at QE, because increasingly you've got people in power, people in office, people of high reputation who are basically succumbing to the idea that this can go on forever. In America, you've got eminent economists surrounding Joe Biden basically telling the US president that he can practice something called modern monetary theory, MMT, same initials as the magic money tree, uh, rather laughably. The idea that it is different this time, that we can just create money, that budget constraints are imposed by people who are heartless and don't want to help the poor. And this modern monetary theory idea, sort of QE on steroids, is now coming over to the UK. I go to seminars in Westminster and hear highly educated people with degrees from top universities telling me that we can carry on creating money forever, almost without limit. Isn't this dangerous for our politics, given that it can only end in tears? Well, um, you know, there are people who believe that you can get perpetual motion and there are other people who are realistic. I mean, I was quite struck. Tim Congdon... Don't forget the tooth fairy. Yeah, the tooth fairy, that's true. Uh, but um, I think even the tooth fairy would struggle with the kind of quantities of money that we're talking about here. Uh, um, Tim Congdon uh, gave evidence to our... Very committee. eminent monetary economist. Yeah, yeah, uh, former uh, treasury wise man. Yeah, uh, he gave evidence to our committee, I think probably back in November. He made exactly your point. He said that inflation would be over 5% by this time next year. And one or two other people said, oh, well, you know, um, this monetary theory is, is not, not, I mean, it's not going to be 5%. Well, where is it? It's over 5% now. It certainly is in America, yeah. Yeah, in America. 5.4%, yeah. yeah. the number just and, came and, out. And, and Tim says, you know, that it could be heading for double digit inflation. And uh, throughout history, we've had people, Elizabeth I thought she could shave the the edges off the currency and melt the, the silver down again to create new money. And what happened? Prices went up. Countless dictators in tin pot Latin American yeah, yeah. countries. Or, or uh, the, the Emperor Diocletian imposed the death penalty uh, to try and control inflation whilst um, abusing the monetary system and it didn't work. <laughs> Do you think the policymaking establishment will listen, will read your report and act? It really is a very powerful document written by people that are difficult to ignore. Well, um, whether they listen or not, um, the bank's going to have to reply uh, and uh, to our report, and it will be debated in the House of Lords. And um, uh, you know, they're going to have to to justify their position, which I'm I'm, I'm sure they they will they will do. Uh, I mean, one of the things that um, uh, happened while we were engaged in our uh, uh, taking evidence uh, was that the Chancellor suddenly extended the remit of the bank to include getting to um, uh, uh, getting the green agenda and getting to um, zero carbon. What's that got to do with central banking? Absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> and it's That's virtue signaling by it, thread needles. No, but it's but it but it but but there are dangers in it because. What it does is, I mean, what's the bank meant to do? Use QE to buy green bonds and not green bonds? How is it going to decide whose green bonds to buy? It takes us into the realm of politics and investment uh, decisions. The central bank, when its role is, should be purely to look after um, the, 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 the monetary position and to maintain stable prices uh, in, in uh, or 2%, this 2% mandate. If the government want to do something on encouraging uh, green companies and investing in them, they should do that using fiscal policy directly and not actually have 
the bank uh, engaged in that. And if you look at the brief, we asked the Chancellor about this, if you look at the brief, the bank is very vague as to what they're supposed to do. So we, we really do think that the Treasury need to come forward and say exactly what it is that they want the bank to do in this area, rather than this rather vague, woolly thing, which um, you know could get us into some difficulty. Well, when the Treasury responds, when the Bank of England responds to your report published today, then we'll certainly be covering that on GB News. Mike oh. Forsyth, Law Forsyth, thanks a lot for coming in. Good to see you. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.